Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Wellen. Thanks for coming to our talk, where we'll be talking about running financial workloads in Kubernetes. Now, you're probably already familiar with what Kubernetes is, and you've heard it a bunch of times. So we're not really going to focus so much on what Kubernetes is, but more about the specific challenges that customers face when they're taking financial workloads and running them on Kubernetes. And we're going to drive it by going through three real world examples. So a bit about me. I'm CEO and co-founder of ISOVALENT. Um, and my background for the better part of the last 15 years, along with my co-founder, Thomas Graff, has been in Linux networking and security, working in the kernel, working on uh, technologies like Open vSwitch. I was one of the founding employees at a company called NYSERA, which built Open vSwitch and was later acquired uh, by VMware to become VMware NSX. And hi, my name is Nila Jacques. Uh, some of you may know me as the former executive director of the Open Daylight Project, where I was working with a number of large financials who are really keen to bring greater programmability to the network. Most recently, I was at Barracuda Networks working on more of the security part of the network. What I want to do is jump right in to tell you a little bit about Isovalent, who we are, and then we'll dive in to the underlying technologies. So we are a Silicon Valley venture-based startup. We're very much an open source company, um, and we maintain two really uh, key open source projects, as well as contribute to a couple others. And uh, we'll talk a lot more about those in the presentation. To begin with, though, Isovalent is most often associated with our flagship open source project, Cilium. What is Cilium? Cilium is an eBPF powered networking observability and security technology built specifically for the cloud native world. So, but what is eBPF? Well, eBPF has been described as giving Linux superpowers. And what eBPF is, and we'll talk a lot more about it, is a way to securely embed programs into the Linux kernel. And this is incredibly useful for things like observability, uh, for things like tracing, as well as networking and security. We're also big believers in, in Kubernetes. And of course, that's why we're having this talk. And uh, we leverage the Envoy project as part of our Cilium solutions you see in the diagram in the middle here. So I think just to start off this presentation, I think one thing that's clear to all of us is that the world of financials has been changing rapidly over the last few years. You know, if we think back, uh, still we see it when we walk down Main Street, banks typically have these big, beautiful buildings because in the old world, differentiation was really about assets and security. A bank is someone that you want to trust. Well, clearly that's still important, but really now the basis of differentiation for a financial has changed dramatically. On one hand, there's the breadth of things. And if you see, if you go to the website of any major financials, almost every company out there has the ability to offer their customers a wide portfolio of offerings. But more subtly, it's also about how it presents those, how a financial is able to interact with its customers. Does it feel like an integrated way or you probably experience going to, uh, uh, going to some banks and finding that every tab that you click feels like you're dealing with a different company, with a different experience, with a different backend application. And more and more, that goes from awkward to being, frankly, not good enough. And so we're seeing the world in which financials, the differentiation of financials is now not so much about assets, but about software. And so so to be able to walk this digital transformation journey, what we're seeing is financials have to build new capabilities. They have to build new applications, but that's also creating requirements for a new type of infrastructure. These new apps that we're creating create a need for us to be able to massively scale up and down. With what we're seeing in the world today, one piece of news can drive everyone to immediately go quickly check their portfolio. And you can go from having 5 million to 50 million to 150 million, all accessing the same underlying app um, that you have. We also need to rapidly change and adapt. The time that we get, for example, to process an acquisition has shrunk down uh, dramatically. And our customers are now all over the world. Information needs to be centralized for privacy and many other reasons. But on the other hand, we need to be able to deliver an experience that is incredibly low latency for our customers. And so we need to place our services really close to our users. Kubernetes 
as an underlying infrastructure was really built in such a way that it can deliver very, very well on all of these requirements. So what is Kubernetes? Some of you may be very, very familiar with Kubernetes. There may be others who don't know as much. So I thought I would spend a little bit of time given an overview of this real critical technology. And I will shamelessly borrow from, uh, from another Linux uh, Foundation family project, the CNCF project, they created this great illustrated children's guide to Kubernetes. And I'm not gonna go through the whole guide. I urge you to go do that on your own, but I wanna take a couple slides because I think they do a good job of illustrating uh, some of the key concepts behind Kubernetes. So the first key concept of Kubernetes, or what has really enabled Kubernetes is a shift in the underlying construct by which we deliver infrastructure. Historically, for the last 30, 40 years, we deliver infrastructure from a server. Um, and while more recently that server has gone virtual from physical, we're still really delivering a server with an operating system that is incredibly uh, heavy, and that has led us to a more monolithic way of developing applications. Over the last few years, there's been a huge surge into the use of a container. What is a container? It's a much more lightweight concept, uh, construct to put in an app. It allows me to be able to encapsulate uh, a set of logic, a, a piece of a service, uh, in a way that is very easy for me to spin up and spin down, very easy for me to scale up and down. Um, and as part of doing that, I'm going to make that construct stateless. So in so many ways, containers are fundamentally changing the way we deliver infrastructure, but we have to recognize that the move to containers has created a whole set of needs. We need to think about how to manage these containers. We need to think about how to, how to network them as they're coming in and out. They need to be scheduled, distributed. Um, we need to load balance, obviously, around them. It's a much better way of delivering things, but it also creates a new set of requirements. And so Kubernetes really came in to be able to solve that second set of challenges. And really what I think Kubernetes does so well is it shifts the entire paradigm from thinking about delivering, uh, delivering an app via a server is the idea of let's turn it around, really think about a service. I'm trying to achieve something. So for example, a shopping cart. A shopping cart's a great example of a service. We understand exactly what it's supposed to what it's supposed to do. And then the delivery of that is just really a matter of scaling towards the demand of a customer. I can create a service and then as I, and that service can be instantiated in a series of containers. And then as I need to scale up and down, I just, I just go ahead and fire up more of these containers or I, I can go ahead and shut them down uh, as people go to sleep. And so a service is a much more logical and better way to be able to think about delivering an application. This is really what Kubernetes is all about. Dan will be going into a lot more detail than this in a second. Um, but let's talk a little bit. I, I mentioned the, one of the challenges in this world where we've now got thousands of these containers um, that, are, that are delivering our applications. One of the challenges of this is being able to network them. And when we think about networking, we certainly think about connecting them. But, um, but you also have to think about, well, what happens when something goes wrong? How do I observe whether all the right connections are being made? Because we've all had that situation of having that, uh, uh, that, spin, that spinning circle as uh, for some reason an application is not being responsive. We also have to make sure, we have to continue to make sure that all of our communication between our services as well as between our services and our customers remains secure. Now for 30 years, we have evolved an entire market around one specific way of delivering this, this monolithic architecture we were, we were talking about. And you know, in, in the old world, um, we really thought about a server and protecting that server and protecting a customer's access in and out. Our security and connectivity was really about hardware devices. And, and most of the time it was about hardware devices that sat between the end customer and the underlying infrastructure. Kubernetes, the Kubernetes architecture undermines this model at every turn. 
IPs may be being created and destroyed every minute of, of every day. Change is constant in that environment. In terms of the bulk of communication, it's no longer user to infrastructure primarily, what we call north-south, but more and more communication is happening between these different services as we've taken a complex application and broken it into a bunch of smaller parts in terms of a bunch of different uh, services. And so our ability to, to connect, to observe and to secure our applications um, has fundamentally changed in this new infrastructure. And so where we are today, I think is actually very interesting. We have, thanks to Kubernetes, thanks to, uh, thanks to containers, we have a far better infrastructure. Linux itself is becoming the, the strategic technology of this world. And this is especially true for, for networking. Unfortunately, the first generation of networking functionality that was built into the cloud native Kubernetes world um, really sought to replicate a lot of the concepts from a prior era. It has a whole set of challenges, which Dan will go into in a second. Um, and so we we realize this is what we're all about at Isovalent, is there's a need to reinvent networking, to reinvent network security from a cloud native perspective. eBPF is a foundational technology that really allows us to do a whole set of things that, that weren't possible before. And we have built Cilium leveraging these superpowers that eBPF gives us to be able to build a new networking observability and security uh, architecture built for the cloud native world. Cool. So thanks, Neela. Hey, folks, it's Dan again. I'm going to jump in and do what I consider at least the fun part, which is getting into the core uh, technology and getting into the customer use cases, which is really, I think, what, what, what really matters at the end of the day. So first off, just one quick slide so that we level set a bit in a bit more detail around why some of these networking challenges exist in a Kubernetes world. So in, in Kubernetes, you have you know, Linux workloads, often VMs, but they can be bare metal, right? And these Linux workloads essentially are managed by the Kubernetes control plane to create a pool of capacity where individual lightweight containerized workloads that Nilo was mentioning before can be scheduled in a highly dynamic way. You know, these physical, these, these, these Linux workloads are connected to an existing network. That's how they might reach out to reach legacy servers and legacy VMs or get to the external internet, um, but they also communicate amongst themselves. And when you, know, you need more capacity, let's say you're scaling up some of your workloads, you're just gonna throw in another one of these Linux workloads. It's gonna be managed by Kubernetes using the kubelet, which is the agent that runs on each um, Kubernetes worker node. And you know, more pods are going to get scheduled to this. And so again, the key things to, to realize here is that you have a dynamic pool of Linux workloads with multiple tenants workloads being scheduled there. You know, they're getting assigned IPs, they're being destroyed, they're getting new IPs. It's a very dynamic environment. Um, and it's connected to your physical network, but your physical network isn't really aware of what is going on at the Kubernetes layer. And as we'll start to jump into some of the, the customer stories in the next couple slides, you know, you'll see that that is a really pivotal um, point in terms of achieving a lot of those requirements that financial enterprises have, have always had. So let me jump into the first user story. Um, we're specifically modeling this on a large US bank, but to be honest with you, this is a pretty universal requirement for a lot of our enterprise customers. It's just probably most extreme within financials and, and other entities that have a ton of compliance requirements. So I think the key thing to remember is that, you know, all of those compliance requirements, this is an example of the PCI, you know, requirement, but there's other things like Sarbanes-Oxley, et cetera. Um, you know, these don't go away simply because you're using Kubernetes. Um, you know, so, you know, obviously a first requirement here is the ability to isolate, you know, a app that may have sensitive user data from another app. This is pretty obvious. This is kind of network security 101. Why is even this something so basic difficult in a Kubernetes world? 
Well, let's imagine, you know, we want to say, hey, tenant A should, of course, be able to talk to other tenant A workloads um, and also, you know, reach out to payments.com. Tenant B should be able to talk to other tenant B workloads and maybe reach out to a database in your legacy infrastructure. And tenant C should only be able to talk to workloads, um, you know, from tenant C. These are pretty simple, you know, not, not mind-blowingly complex um, isolation challenges that you might need to do to meet your basic um, security compliance requirements. But the problem is, you know, traditionally, what would you do? You put tenant A on a VLAN, tenant B on a VLAN, tenant C on a VLAN, and use a traditional physical firewall to isolate them. But the problem is, is twofold, actually. First off, you know, physical firewalls that are seeing this traffic it has no idea if the traffic, for example, on that first Linux worker node came from pod one or pod two. So how does it know what that traffic should or shouldn't be able to talk to? It doesn't understand the identity at a Kubernetes layer of the workloads when it's seeing packets at the network layer. The second one is also pretty obvious from this diagram, right? If pod one is talking to pod two there, it's never even going through the physical network. It's never going through your physical firewall. Therefore, a traditional firewall would not even see this connectivity even at a network layer. So it's pretty clear that kind of even the basic multi-tenancy requirements that you need um, for, for compliance can't really be, me, be met with traditional firewalls in a Kubernetes environment. So what can we do here? Well, Kubernetes has a construct called network policy. Network policy is a way of defining network connectivity and restricting network connectivity inside of a Kubernetes environment in a way that isn't based on IPs, because those IPs change all the time. You'd be constantly updating your firewall rules. You know, you'd lose all of the agility benefits of Kubernetes, but instead based on higher level identity, where you can say, for example, in a declarative policy, you can say tenant A workloads should only be able to talk to other tenant A workloads and talk to www.payments.com. And then wherever those workloads end up getting scheduled, in this case, Cilium, we're using Cilium to implement network policy, you know, will program eBPF in the Linux kernel to make sure that wherever tenant A workloads pop up, it has exactly that type of access and no more. And because Cilium and eBPF are running inside of the Linux kernel on each one of those Kubernetes worker nodes, there is no network connectivity, even network connectivity within a, work, within a single Linux worker node that isn't seen and managed by these security policies. So first takeaway is firewall policies still need to be applied inside of a Kubernetes world and network policy is a Kubernetes construct combined with a CNI plugin like Cilium that lets you achieve that. But this user story isn't done. Uh, the same bank has not just firewalling requirements but also security visibility requirements to meet their compliance, right? You know, you've probably seen requirements that say, hey, you must be able to monitor and log all, all network access to systems with sensitive data. You have the exact same problem you have in the firewall world. If your logs just contain IP addresses, how do you know who was accessing what sensitive systems, right? Those IP addresses don't actually tell you what workload and with what data, you know, something was potentially accessed. Similarly, your, your requirements, your compliance requirements might require you to be running intrusion detection. Well, you could run intrusion detection for all of your workloads north-south, but how do you ensure, for example, that only a select set of apps have intrusion detection enforced if their compliance requirements dictate that, and that that intrusion detection even sees all of the service-to-service -service communication between them? It's essentially exactly the same problem for firewalling, just in a visibility context. So, you know, again, the traditional IP and port-based logs don't give you the visibility and any network monitoring capability that isn't fully distributed will not give you that capability. So again, you need something that is A, running inside of every one of your Linux workloads, right? And that sees every bit of traffic um, that is going between the workloads and sees it not just at an IP level, but sees it in a way where those logs can include, you know, detail about exactly what Kubernetes service was communicating at that exact time. And that's really the power that you get with a platform like Cilium and eBPF 
is that you're able to get all of your network audit and network connectivity information exported into, for example, the SIM that your SecOps team uses like Splunk or Elastic or whatever else, maybe ArcSight. Um, you know, and you're able to get that data, but in a fully identity aware way, such that if your security team comes back three weeks later and says, hey, this IP address from your Kubernetes environment did something suspicious, you have the full audit trail there of, oh, I understand what team service that was at what time. If it is determined that that service was compromised, I can tell maybe how that attacker moved laterally within the organization, what information the attacker may or may not have gotten access to. So that wraps up user story number one. User story number two is another security centric story. It's probably not a terrible surprise given how important security is to, to financials. This is actually um, from a startup who is a pay in the payment space. Um, they migrated their app from an on-prem data center where they had strong kind of guarantees about physical security um, to a cloud data center. And as part of that, they were trying to understand how they could get stronger guarantees about encrypting traffic in transit, um, as obviously there's a lot of sensitive payment related data um, that was being transferred between their different services and from their services to various payment gateways um, uh, that, 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 that they integrate with. So of course, the traditional way that you would encrypt data in transit would be at the application layer. Your application developers would you know build their applications using for example tls and um you know rely on encryption at the application layer now that's fine and it's secure when done properly but there's a couple downsides to that you know first off if you initially built your application assuming it was an environment where you didn't need to worry about encryption right but now as part of your cloud transformation for example you are now moving to an environment where you do need to worry about encryption Right, you now have to go back to every one of your application teams and go tell them to change how they built and run their apps to, um, to add encryption. The other part is that even if they did add encryption, you don't necessarily know the choices of encryption ciphers, TLS version ciphers, et cetera, that, they, that they've chosen. So I don't know how many of you have seen this. I know I got several emails like this recently. You know, there's a basically a deadline for PCI compliance that you have to have moved off of older versions of TLS and that, that, that they'll now be fully deprecated. Um, this article is from July. I feel like I got several emails in the last couple of months about this from, from different um, SaaS providers um, basically saying TLS, older versions of TLS will no longer be supported. So now what, what happens here is you have to go and tell all of your application developers, hey, to continue to be compliant, you have to go update all of your apps. And while that's certainly possible, it's much easier if you just have kind of a easy button um, that you can transparently apply these more stringent security requirements to your application. And that's what's actually possible in kind of a Kubernetes world with something like Cilium, is that you're actually able to just declare Say, hey, workloads from these sets of pods, right, should always be encrypted. It doesn't matter what the application has done. In the Linux kernel itself, add the encryption on top of the underlying communication. And so what that gives you is not only saves your, your development team's time, but it also, from a security perspective, gives you a lot of certainty. You know for sure that all of that traffic is encrypted. Um, you know exactly what encryption parameters were used to encrypt that traffic. And so, you know, this is, I always, we joke, we have a, one of our customers used to call this boom encryption <laughs> because you set it once and boom, it's everywhere, as opposed to having to go team by team by team, trying to nag and, and corral them to kind of being fully compliant. And then realizing that at any moment they may deploy a new part of their app that is no longer compliant and you have to continue to track them down. So transparent encryption is kind of a new model of thinking about moving those, the, the work needed to meet those compliance requirements to the infrastructure layer rather than solving it in each individual app. All right, and now the last one is actually a combination of two different user stories. One is a large US insurance provider and the other is a uh, Europe-based um, financial payments company. And I think there's an old joke that I think it's in real estate, there's only three things that matter, location, location, location. Um, I think in financial services software, you probably say, well, there's security, but location, location, location as well. You know, there's several examples. Neela already touched on this first one. 
which is often, you know, you, you'll need geographic proximity to an exchange or to another financial API to reduce latency of a transaction. But there's also tons of requirements around data residency, right? You know, if you're a global financial institution, you'll often find that you have to store the data for your customers in Germany, you know, in Germany, in Germany, right? I can't tell you the number of financials that are saying, well, I'm going to either do, you know, I'm probably going to have Alibaba as a cloud at some point because I'm going to need to do work in China, right? So you're kind of almost inherently, if you're a global financial, biting off these um, types of data residency requirements. And then the last one, this is particularly relevant, I think, for the insurance company, but it's probably relevant for, for all the financials, is fault tolerance. You need to know that even, and probably especially, you know, if your data center, which might be in your home region, is knocked out, you still have other locations um, that are fault tolerant. You know, if there's a hurricane that hits, hits your home area where your, your primary data center is, and that's exactly when your clients are going to be filing claims and wanting to check in on their policies. And you need to be able to make sure that, that you have that, that fault tolerance built in. So... You know, the key challenge here from a Kubernetes perspective is that you want to be able to still apply those security policies that you had in place, but now these workloads aren't in the same cluster. But you don't want to expose, for example, a service in your primary data center, you know, to all other workloads in your internal network, just so, you know, a Kubernetes cluster in your trading one location can access it, right? That's not at all least privilege. What you want to be able to do is essentially have those, fine, those same fine-grained zero-trust policies, even for workloads that may be spanning uh, different, different geographic regions for any of the reasons that we talked about in the last slide. So the answer here is to kind of create a mesh of the Kubernetes networks. Cilium has a feature that can do this called Cilium Cluster Mesh. But essentially, you want it to be a single fabric from a network identity perspective so that when a packet arrives at your primary data center, you, know, you can tell that it came from tenant C and should be allowed to go to a tenant C workload, um, but not a tenant B workload or a tenant A workload. The same thing applies to those security, security visibility requirements we talked about, right? Your logging needs to be able to log and understand that, hey, service A was talking to service B, even if service A and service B were in different geographic locations. And so really you can kind of think of this last aspect of as being able to preserve the critical identity for security enforcement and security visibility, even despite you know, these, these kind of requirements of financial workloads to often run in different geographic locations. Cool. So just to wrap up, we talked about three main user stories. We talked about the need to be able to meet the core you know, firewall and security monitoring requirements that financials face by adding an understanding of Kubernetes identity in a world where IP addresses have become meaningless. We talked about being able to you know, add transparent encryption to be able to meet encryption requirements when, for example, a workload moves from a you know, maybe on-prem environment where encryption wasn't critical to a cloud environment where it now is critical. And for user story number three, we talked about being able to guarantee these types of properties um, in a secure way, despite having these apps geographically distributed um, as is required for many reasons in, in the cases of financial services software. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna encourage you to check out and learn more about eBPF and Cilium if that's interesting uh, to you. We actually recently just hold, hosted a virtual conference of ourselves, the eBPF Summit, and we had um, Capital One talk there, which will, I think, resonate with a lot of the user stories I just talked about above. So I'd encourage you to check out that video. It's only a five minute video, so really easy, easy to talk um, or easy to, to take in. And then um, you know, we'll be live on the conference chat if you want to chat right now. Or, um, you know, always feel free to reach out to Neela or I on Twitter. And if you want updates around uh, Cilium, um, feel free to follow Cilium Project on Twitter as well. All right. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.